Hey all, today I'm going to talk about chapter 13 where we cover translation from nucleic acid to amino acid. We are going to cover most of chapter 13. We are going to cover box 13.1 um, nonsense suppressors. However, I would like you to skip box 13.2 and toolbox 13.1 for the sake of time. So just to review, here's our central dogma of molecular biology, how things work. We've got our DNA that is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into polypeptides. That's where we are now, the translation step. Okay. Chapter 12, we previously covered the process of translation. Okay. So DNA, one cop, uh, DNA strand is the template for the RNA sequence that's transcribed in the same alphabet over to RNA. And now we've got our messenger RNA we're going to talk about. And so this five prime end of the RNA becomes the N terminus of the polypeptide. Okay, we've got the N and C termini, which we'll talk about briefly. We're going to translate that. It's going to go from the nucleic acid alphabet into the amino acid alphabet here. Okay, so for every three bases, our codon is going to code for one amino acid. And these protons are what, <laughs> proteins are what are going to make our phenotypes here. So things like eye color, p shape, antibiotic resistance, uh, muscle fibers, collagen, any protein thing in your body is made up of, of these strings of amino acids, which are then bent and folded and become uh, useful. So first off, the process of translation. So like in transcription, there is a slight difference in translation between what happens in eukaryotes and prokaryotes, okay? but less complicated in than in transcription. So uh, translation in bacteria, mRNAs are translated as soon as they are transcribed. Ribosomes are right there next to the chromosomes and they just hop right on and go along their merry way. Whereas in eukaryotes, there's a movement, right? There's the, the mRNA has to exit the nuclear membrane through one of the nuclear pores. It can only do that after it's been spliced and has a cap and tail added. So there's this idea of a mature RNA before it leaves the nucleus. And then after it exits the nucleus, now it can be snagged by a ribosome, either free floating or attached to the endoplasmic reticulum in order to be translated. But overall, translation is very similar in bacteria and eukaryotes. So we're not going to have to do a whole lot of compare or contrast here. Same process. So we're going to build an amino acid polymer chain here, okay, by adding on sequential amino acid residues. And that's going to form uh, peptide bonds in between them, quite sturdy, okay. And at one end we have our N terminal and the other end we have our C terminal. Now the N terminal is kind of our head analogous to our uh, methyl cap on the messenger RNA. Okay. So here's an amino acid to break down further. So we've got the amino group on one end, that's going to be our end terminal, and then we're going to add subsequent amino acids to that C and the carboxyl group, okay, with the side chain having the interesting properties along the backbone, okay. So here's an amino acid going along, we have our end terminal, we're going to keep in translation, we're going to keep adding on to the C terminal uh, stepwise, one amino acid after the another to make a long uh, polymer, polypeptide, which will then become a functional protein once it gets into its final form. So how translation goes? Well, fascinating little buggers called tRNAs, transfer RNAs, are going to bring amino acids to the mRNA. And those tRNAs are going to match up according to the uh, codons there. So the codon and the mRNA is going to match up to an anti-codon on the tRNA. Line up. The peptide bond will connect to the next uh, amino acid there. Amino acids are added stepwise to that C terminus of the chain. The a new transfer RNA is going to enter as the uncharged one, the one that has lost its amino acid exits. Another peptide bond is connected to the, um, to the chain and so on and so forth. This is going to keep going. So there's this entry of the new tRNA elongation of the chain, and then an exit as the uncharged TNA leaves. So our first working piece here of translation is the transfer RNA. Okay? Transfer RNA is a little loop of RNA. It's about a 90 bases long. Okay? Key ends, you've got the five prime end of your RNA here. So this is transfer RNA is one of those we call non-coding because it's not actually uh, being, being translated. Okay? Five prime end there, goes around, makes three main loops. 
The second loop encodes the anti-codon. This is what's going to match to the codon on the mRNA strand. And then at the three prime end is where an amino acid gets attached. Okay, and so a special type of enzyme, and there's one for each kind of, of uh, tRNA called an amino acyl tRNA synthetase, okay, attaches the specific amino acid to the three prime end based on the anti codon there. Okay? Our other tool here is the ribosome. Okay? So we've got um, two subunits usually, like a major subunit and then the minor subunit, the smaller one. They have different molecular weights. That's how they're referred to in between eukaryotic and prokaryotic ones. And there are little pockets in the ribosome, and they've got three different sites for three different purposes. We have the amino acyl site, A, that's where things enter here. The peptidyl site, where the peptide bond is formed here. And finally, the exit site, where the uncharged DNA leaves the ribosome, okay? So one codon is exposed at the amino acid site each time, and then the mRNA is threaded between these subunits as the chain goes along and grows. So here's more about the structure of the ribosome. The, the ribosome is kind of complicated. We've got these rRNA, which stands for ribosomal RNAs here, and so they're expressed by molecular weight, okay? Uh, so bacteria have the 23 uh, and the 5S and then the 16S rRNA, and these are very um, interesting to look at if you want to differentiate between different types of bacteria. Okay. And then in eukaryotes, you have um, more different strips of RNA here, and oh, here's the other minor subunit there, okay. which we're not going to memorize or anything. It's just uh, neat to differentiate between the two. However, it turns out that uh, bacteria and eukaryotic ribosomes can act on both bacterial and eukaryotic mRNA, which is kind of neat. Okay? And so there's a very specific spot deep within the structure that is recognizing the um, codons, uh, sort of chunking them along, and that's where the transfer RNA is going to come in and match up. Okay? So tRNA is depicted in a bunch of different ways. Okay, So we've got more of a, a graphical representation. There's all this interesting intrastrand base pairing making specific loops. Okay, And then you have this exposed where it flips around and the anticodon is exposed in the 3D structure. Simplified down, we kind of get this like three-leaf clover symbol, which uh, this particular one shows all the different bases pairing. This is even more simplified, where it just shows the codon at the base. And our book tends to use this little like trident view, Okay, not to scale. Okay. It's interesting because Francis Crick posed this adapter molecule being made of an RNA sequence before transfer RNA was ever discovered. Good prediction, Guy. Well done. So while we're in the middle of this ribosome, elongation is occurring. It's a, I would highly recommend watching the video. Uh, this is one of those things where watching it actually move is a lot more handy than seeing a series of pictures. Okay, A lot of things are happening during each elongation cycle. The uncharged TNA from before is exiting and a new TNA, tRNA, is arriving. Okay, And then everything sort of shifts down by one codon chunk. The next tRNA exits and the new one arrives. Okay, you See how blue has now moved from uh, the A site to the P site okay, over the course of one step of elongation. Starting all this okay, is where uh, we need our start codon, AUG. Okay? When that, that comes in the amino acyl site, it moves to the peptidyl site. Okay? It kind of skips right along thanks to initiation factor proteins. And then the second codon comes in and starts. But this methionine um, and the uh, tRNA there is the only one that sort of jumps the gun and moves to the peptidyl site without the initial bond being made. That'll happen in the next amino acid to come. Okay. And finally, in termination, there are no tRNAs that recognize the stop codons, UAG, UAA, and UGA. They all have names. We'll get to that in a bit. They stop translation because there is not a tRNA that can recognize them that can go in here. This just is empty. Okay, They stop translation. And then with this empty site, um, at that point, termination factor proteins release the polypeptide. Okay, So the stop codon appears at the amino acyl site. That's when the peptide chain terminates. Okay. This, there's a lot of specific terminology in this particular chapter. So.
And so this is a little interesting. I'm keeping box 13.1 because nonsense suppressors are kind of neat. So um, usually, you know, there would be this wild type, let's say this terosinase um, uh, transfer RNA here is recognizing UAU. Stop codon doesn't have a corresponding tRNA. However, tRNA can be coded, it's coded for in DNA and it can be mutated. Okay, tRNA mutates. So now in this particular little tRNA, the anticodon has changed. Instead of being AUA is now UAC and now accidentally blips onto this particular nonsense codon, which is kind of fun. Okay, so this is called, um, there's a, we have originally a nonsense mutation that codes for no amino acid, right? But then if the tRNA gets mutated and matches to that codon, it matches to a stop codon, this mutation suppresses the nonsense mutation. We keep going, like the mRNA can keep being read past that mutation into the untranslated region. So this is called a suppressor, you know, like the suppressor tRNA there, this guy here, this mutated transfer RNA. Because this suppressor mutation is overcoming the effect of a previous mutation. So there's, there's a bunch of different examples that are different, not just transfer RNAs. You can have different suppressor mutations that change something back. They almost revert another mutation. Okay. So there's some historical names for stop codons. UAG is called the amber codon. Um, and so if you have a nonsense mutation to UAG and your tRNA there, okay, you have a what's called a amber mutant okay, in the tRNA there. We And then UAA was called the ochre. Um, you would have ochre yeah. mutants and opal mutants if you accidentally had um, tRNAs start coding for um, stop codons. And so a lot of these suppressors, we call them, were used in early E. coli research. So you'd have a wild type cell that when it got infected, it would go ahead and get lysed by a particular phage. But then if you had an amber mutant phage here, okay, that is producing messed up tRNA there, it's not, it doesn't work. The phage isn't replicating the bacteria course normally. But if you take the amber mutant phage and you have a E. coli with this amber mutant suppressor, Okay, so you now do have a tRNA that is working. I totally wrote tRNA there. Um, it sort of subs in and, and overcomes that mutation, and now you have phage replication and lysing of bacteria again. Sort of two wrongs do make a right in this case, but pretty neat. So.